So the first is our new professor in biological geography, Professor uh, Brad Stevens, and he's going to talk about finding and uh, clarify. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, I am a new professor here, but not a new professor. I'm a rather old <laughs> professor. Um, spent about 12 years in uh, Rhode Island, the University of Rhode Island, and just moved here in January, so I'm happy to be here. And I have some new people in the lab that uh, followed me, so I want to introduce them really quickly. This is Matt Burke, who uh, was a student with me in Rhode Island for a couple years and has just moved down here in the last week or so. He's working on the effects of ocean acidification and low oxygen and temperature on uh, squid metabolism. Alyssa Andres, that's you. <laughs> just, uh, just joined the lab. She got a jump start this summer on her research on uh, climate related effects on uh, sharks. Uh, we did some work in New Jersey this summer, so that was great. Also just moved here in the last couple weeks. We have uh, Agnieszka Domowska is a postdoc in the lab. She goes by Aga. She's not here today, but um, she is. She did a master's degree with me in Rhode Island years ago, and then went away and did a PhD in ion transport uh, in fish gills. And now she's back doing ocean acidification-related um, physiology. And last but not least, we have uh, Tracy Shaw, who. I've known for years, we met as undergrads ages ago, and uh, we did some work in the Antarctic, and um, was fortunate enough to be able to hire her in my lab a few years ago. She is a zooplankton ecologist and a technician in my lab currently. So, so what I want to talk to you today about are uh, climate-related um, effects on pteropods. Um, there are many climate-related stressors Three biggies are these, global warming, uh, deoxygenation, and ocean acidification. As carbon dioxide goes into the ocean, it reacts with seawater, causing a reduction in pH. Um, there are many others in addition to these, and all of these will interact with each other in various complicated ways, and you'll get interactions with, for example, uh, I don't know what any of these are. There's, um, <laughs> uh, this is from a paper recently by Denise uh, Breitberg um, called On Top of All That, Coping with Ocean Acidification in the Midst of Many Stressors. And one I'll be focusing on today is uh, food availability as it relates to uh, pteropod metabolism. And one of the take home messages is that if you understand the mechanism of the interaction, um, either a direct effect of a single stressor or the interaction of multiple stressors. If you understand the mechanism, you can begin to make predictions about um, how that will affect organisms and start making predictions of their changes in uh, distributions with climate. So this is an example of a known mechanism in uh, oxygen transport. Ocean acidification directly affects the ability of blood to bind oxygen, as does temperature. You go from cold to warm. Um, and oxygen binding, obviously, is influenced by oxygen itself as well. So those three related stressors cause blood to go from completely saturated with oxygen to deoxygenated. And from that information, we can begin to make maps of the distribution of these organisms, um, knowing the environmental levels of these three uh, stressors. Uh, you may have seen this last spring, Curtis Deutsch was here as one of our preeminent scholars. Um, he gave a talk that included uh, this work, which was a collaboration we did um, last year, showing that you can map based on oxygen demand of an organism and the oxygen, environmental oxygen supply, you can start to map um, species distributions. So that's sort of an overarching goal of the work um, in my lab, the uh, mapping and modeling mostly through collaboration with people like Curtis, but uh, understanding the physiological mechanism that allows you to do that is what we focus on. So uh, focusing mostly on ocean acidification today, um, as I mentioned, CO2 goes in the ocean, you get uh, reductions in pH, and you also get a reduction in the carbonate ion as a result of that. And the carbonate ion is what allows organisms to produce calcium carbonate shells and this is one of the reasons that pteropods are thought to be very susceptible. And ocean acidification has really come onto the scene. People weren't really aware of it prior to about 2000. 
three. There were some studies in the coral community, but beyond that, um, ocean acidification was largely unknown. And the term ocean acidification came about, I think, in 2003. And now you get comments like this one, the consequences for ocean life for shaking the biological underpinnings of civilization. I don't even know what that means, but it sounds scary. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, you still get some of our senators that uh, deny that ocean acidification is a problem at all. Because we emit CO2, it must not be harmful. Of course, there's a reason we emit it. Um, <laughs> it is harmful. But uh, the main concern is with calcifying organisms. Uh, this is a pteropod shell held at some unknown CO2 concentration over time, and you can see it uh, gradually dissolving. Corals are a major concern, and the reason is that as the concentration of the carbonate ion declines with increasing CO2, the seawater is less saturated and more prone to dissolution. So when this equilibrium is equal to one, it, a calcium carbonate sh uh, shell is more likely to dissolve than to precipitate. The calcium carbonate is more likely to dissolve than precipitate. How many people in this room have ever seen a pteropod with their own two eyes? Handful of you. And this is an oceanography audience. Um, you can imagine the general public has no idea what a pteropod is, or at least they didn't um, before. Um, but because of ocean acidification, pteropods are suddenly sort of a poster child and they've become very popular. So this is a video produced by the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Make sure the sound is off. Oops, back up. Just to give you some idea what these um, organisms look like for those of you that aren't very familiar. They're commonly called sea angels or sea butterflies. Some of them are naked. They do not have a shell. So there's two major groups. The gymnosomes don't have a shell. The thecosomes have a calcium carbonate or aragonite shell. They have paired wings, so they're gastropods, type of snail. Um, but rather than crawling along the bottom, their foot has evolved into paired wings and they swim through the water. The thecosomes, the shelled ones, these guys and these guys, produce a mucus web that they put out in the water column and it collects particles for food. So they're feeding on particles that they've trapped. The gymnosomes without the shells, so there's a feeding web of this pteropod here. The gymnosomes feed, as far as we know, exclusively on thecosomes. So wherever you find thecosomes, you also find gymnosomes. They um, have evolved hooks and cones in their head that shoot out and grab the shell, manipulate the animal, and yank the animal out of the shell. So the the apparatus in their head is very specific to a particular type of shell. So a gymnosome that eats one type of thecosome can't eat another type of thecosome. So they have hooks like this and weird suckers. And so each species is specific to one type of prey. So it's a very unique situation. But they are quite angelic, lovely to watch. They're fairly small. I don't know if you can tell from the video. This one um, gets up to about an inch long or so. And that's about as big as they get. So. so those are pteropods. They have, that was to show they have calcium carbonate shells like clams, oysters, and corals, and other things. So as I mentioned, uh, prior to about 2003, nobody had ever heard of them. When I first started trying to work on them um, and talk to people about getting funding, um, I would get comments like, they're not important, you won't be able to find them, they're too patchy, don't bother. And then uh, we published this paper in 2003 that had some preliminary experiments that uh, Vicky Fabry had done that showed uh, a pteropod stuck in a jar and its own respiratory CO2 caused the aragonite saturation state to drop and its shell uh, dissolved noticeably. So this was just sort of preliminary data that we included in this review. And it was in the Advanced Applied Biodiversity Science Journal, which I hadn't heard of before and haven't heard of since. <laughs> it, um, it got published or uh, cited, I think, about 30 times since then. But that work was repeated, or should say republished, 
the same observations were published in these three papers, which have each been cited over a thousand times. Um, none of those, none of these four papers have controls, carbonate chemistry, sample size, or statistics. And this was what led to the pteropods being put on the front page of every paper, pretty much. And you got stories like this one. If business insider is telling you marine life is going to be screwed, then somebody's <laughs> really done a pretty good <laughs> marketing job, I think. And the, the market, marketing job they did was to sell ocean acidification, not like global warming, but to say it's a very simple story, and we understand it all already, and we have to do something about it. So unlike global warming, ocean acidification is simple. Man makes CO2. CO2 goes in the water. Snails go bye-bye. Fishies and whales starve to death. So um, there's zero evidence for any of that, but there is some evidence now that says pteropods are sensitive. Their calcification rates do decline as CO2 increases. But what's interesting here is that even below saturation, where the shells should be dissolving, there's still net calcification. So the biology is able to overcome uh, the decreased rate. So there's still net calcification going on, even though the CO2 is fairly high there. Um, there was a symposium recently uh, in Sanibel Island, just south, that I gave a talk on. The title of the talk, or the title of the entire uh, symposium, was "Mollusks in Peril," and a friend of mine presented this. Uh, <laughs> reminded her of this cautionary, like this is the rating for March of the Penguins. It was rated uh, U, which I don't know what that's there. It's universal, but it contains mild peril. And so I, <laughs> I thought that was appropriate for the, the peril that pteropods might be in. The other thing that I wanted to mention about the work that's being done on pteropods is that the vast majority of it is from net caught animals. Uh, this is uh, my net that's down in our basement here now. It's designed to catch deep sea animals in fairly good condition. We can catch jellyfish alive. But even with this, we can't catch pteropods in perfect condition. Their shells are damaged by nets, and yet the vast majority of studies on calcification are done on net-caught animals. In the Antarctic, we had a small plankton net that we would drag, and we also had these fancy uh, jelly dippers, we called them, but they're beakers on the end of a broom handle. <laughs> um, so you can catch them without damaging them. And if you compare animals uh, caught in these two methods, you see a noticeable difference in respiration and calcification. So what we prefer to do is catch them by hand wherever possible. We do a lot of blue water scuba diving for pteropods. This is my former student, Abigail Bacchus, just graduated this spring, catching a pteropod, which is a slow, painful process. So it's a lot easier to catch them with a net. <laughs> There's the pteropod there. So you can catch them by hand without doing any damage to them. And you can get, you can get them to um, stay alive in captivity. And uh, my former student, Amy Moss, has uh, bred some species through several generations now. So. So this is uh, the one most people are familiar with, if they're familiar at all with pteropods. This is Limacina helicina. It reminds me, for those of you old enough to remember the first screensavers, those flying toasters. That's, um, that's what it looks like. So that's in an aquarium. And this is Cleone, which feeds exclusively on Limacina. So I was trying to get this Cleone to feed on this Limacina, and I've never been able to catch that on film. I've seen them do it when I didn't have my camera, but I've never seen them do it with a camera present. So, But uh, some people have seen them with their shell in their mouth. So this is the capturing process. They go from looking fairly angelic to looking pretty horrific. Um, I've always said if they were six feet long, nobody would go in the ocean. <laughs> Wicked. So we studied. Um, we first got funded to study them related to temperature, and it was purely a, a physiological interest story, and we wanted to compare animals living in a temperate environment to living in a polar environment. Um, these two uh, individuals, uh, 
populations were considered the same species, Cleone limacina, and I've called it Cleone antarctica for clarification. Turns out that there's about 30% uh, divergence in um, gene sequence in this group. So they are definitely not the same species, but nobody knows enough about pteropods to tell them apart otherwise. One of the interesting things you can do with pteropods is you can dissect away all the useless parts of the animal, just keep the wing and this ring, this nerve ring. This is a ring of ganglia that all mollusks have. You can insert a electrode into it and you can put a motion sensor on the wings and control the temperature and you can record the swim cycle in these animals when they're sending a signal to the wings and what the temperature effect of that um, signal is. And what we showed was that um, as temperature increases, the swim cycle increases, they're able to swim faster and faster, but the Antarctic population at a given temperature swims faster than the temperate population. So this is compensation for low temperature in these animals. And how they're able to do that is by increasing the number of mitochondria in the muscles. So in order to generate enough energy to swim at a particular speed, you have to have mitochondria, which generates ATP. In the temperate species, Cleone limacina, you can see the dark stain here. Those are mitochondria. So they have a distinct red muscle and a distinct white muscle equivalent that doesn't have much mitochondria. So they're able to um, sprint effectively. So we use white muscle when we sprint, and we use red muscle for marathon running. These pteropods do the same thing. In the Antarctic, they've generated so much mitochondria in order to produce energy to swim at cold temperatures that they've displaced all the white muscle. They don't have any white muscle left or any room for it. And in addition to that, each mitochondria has a lot more what's called Christy surface area. And the surface area of this membrane is where you put all the enzymes that generate the ATP, all the citric acid cycle enzymes are on the uh, inner membrane of the mitochondria. And it's a lot higher in the Antarctic species than in the temperate species. In fact, in the Antarctic, the mitochondria are the equivalent of what you would find in tuna and hummingbirds, whereas in the temperate species, they're closer to humans and other slugs. So, so you can see them, the Antarctic species swimming like this, it never changes speed. So at minus two degrees, the temperate species, on the other hand, has sort of a bimodal distribution of its speed. It has a slow speed, and you can touch it on the tail, and it'll swim away faster. It'll try to get away from you and swim faster. You can induce that by adding serotonin, a neurotransmitter. So they've got a two-geared swimming system, and they've lost one of those gears when they evolved in the Antarctic. So they can't escape from predators. When you touch them on the tail, they just curl up into a ball in the Antarctic. However, they've evolved a toxin in the Antarctic. So this was a cool little study done by McClintock and others. Uh, they showed that fish will eat cod mussel, fish will eat amphipods, they won't eat pteropods. And there's an amphipod that actually abducts pteropods and carries it around on their back. <laughs> and it keeps the fish from eating them. So I thought that was pretty clever of them. All right, so in the process of that study, we made an interesting discovery. We were measuring oxygen consumption rates of these pteropods, and we found that um, We, we found differences between the two seasons we were there. So we were there actually three seasons. So this 99, I was there for the Antarctic Biology Training Course. Um, from there, we got funded and went back in 2001 and 2002. And there were differences in those years. So in 99, 99 and 2001, metabolic rates were fairly high. In 2002, they were much, much lower. And in 2001, we had held animals in the lab and deprived them of their favorite little limacina morsel, so they were starved. And so the metabolic rates of the starved ones matched what we saw in 2002. So when we got funded to go back to study ocean acidification, we had this in mind. And we, again, saw differences uh, seasonally. 
And as Kendra talked about this morning, the extent of the sea ice has a large effect on phytoplankton and, and predators and the, the whole ecosystem in general. It sort of controls uh, the ecosystem. So we showed that with relatively few years of data that uh, in years where there was uh, low chlorophyll abundance throughout the Ross Sea Polynya, um, so like one year um, there was a large iceberg that gummed up the works and kept the sea ice from breaking up in the way it normally does. So phytoplankton productivity was lower um, in this year than this one, for example. And there's a rough correlation between the metabolic rates we measured, the oxygen consumption rates we measured, and the amount of chlorophyll available to them uh, for food. So in 2007 and 2008, we were there to study ocean acidification in these guys. And of course, we saw this difference between animals in each of those years uh, when we measured them without CO2. In 2007, we measured them with CO2. So 380 was the control. So this is as a function of body mass. Oops, back up here. So as a function of body mass, um, the control, low CO2, had higher metabolism than the high CO2. So CO2 has a depressing effect on metabolism, or at least it did in 2007. 2008, we found no difference with CO2. So what we believe is going on here is that we had um, both food deprivation and CO2 independently cause a reduction in metabolic rate, uh, a metabolic suppression. And there's a limit to how far you can suppress metabolism. It's an evolved response. So you would suppress metabolism if you are energy limited. For example, intertidal animals do this a lot um, when the tide goes out and they're stuck there for a couple of weeks um, with low oxygen and high CO2 and less food available, they'll shut metabolism down and wait for the tide to come back in. So it's fairly common. And while I'm on this topic, on September 23rd, we will have a speaker here named Ken Story. He's a collaborator of mine from Canada. He studies uh, metabolic suppression in all sorts of systems from frozen frogs to intertidal animals. Um, he's one of the more entertaining speakers you'll ever see. Um, he's also the strangest man you'll ever meet. Um, so I encourage you to come to that. And if you want to meet with him, let me know. So anyway, evolved response 